rights on paper don't really mean anything. That there are other For countries sure. that have existed, like the USSR, that had a far superior constitution uh, to the United States. There were way more rights that were delegated out specifically in these texts than anything our Constitution provides for. Um, but the difference is, in, in the United States, we have strong institutions that guarantee those rights. And that at the right. end of the day, yeah, your rights come down to the institutions that exist to protect them, not just what's on paper. So when somebody tells me that we have all these freedoms in the United States and all that, and we do have a lot in some ways that I think are really cool, and I appreciate that, I'm trying to think of it from the perspective of somebody that can't afford things. How much do these rights matter. So for instance, if we made it so that every single gun in the United States cost $20 million, does your right to own a gun actually exist at that point? Like, no. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Radio Free America. We've got Destiny joining us tonight. But first, let me remind everybody, we're brought to you tonight by the Dollhouse, the finest purveyor of waifus on the planet. If you're going to buy a doll, buy from the biggest, buy from the best at dollhouse.com. Also, rocketheater.com, off-grid heating for your house, your hunting lodge, your cabin. If you mention my name, Halsey, you get $50 off your first order at rocketheater.com. Destiny, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Um, I watched your your um, kind of panel with, with uh, Jesse Lee Peterson the other day. Mm-hmm. It, it begs the question. You you seem like I, I don't know about like all the degeneracy degeneracy shit that people talk about, mm-hmm. but you seem pretty level headed when it comes to like gun rights, when it comes to capitalism, when it comes to anti being against riots. Mm-hmm. Why Biden? <clears throat> I I mean why not? I mean I, we could literally talk about almost any reason. Um, I, where do you want to start? I mean, or I can... no, I'm saying like, like, give me what's your main reason? Like, what's the biggest reason you think why Biden? Um, so biggest reasons are one, I would like to see the United. Well, the biggest right now is getting a comprehensive handle on the coronavirus. It, it's unlikely, but it's possible that we could still be more than 12 months out from a vaccine. It's possible. Um, now, optimistically, we're looking for uh, halfway through next year that we'll start having something distributed. But it's like it's pretty clear right now that the current administration just doesn't have a handle on what's going on. And if for no if for no other reason, like the coronavirus, I think is reason enough to, to want somebody like Biden in office over Trump. But what could Biden do differently? That's that's what I've I've, I've been stuck on this for a while now. Obviously, I probably have le- I, I'm, I have less of a fear of it. Mm-hmm. And and I'm speaking as someone. Listen, my wife's on quarantine right now. I have to figure out a way to, to handle my kids. My mom has it. My father's on quarantine because of it. My my main client has it. So I I, I get the I get the fear, but I, I don't understand what Biden could do differently. So the best thing that we could probably have right now is a federal top-down response in terms of how we ought to be dealing with the coronavirus. Like, what is the process by which schools are open? Do we have these mandates state by state for mask wearing, for social distancing? Like, these are the types of things that we need so that we can move into the next era of our existence and get away from this 100,000 fucking cases a day of coronavirus stuff. I agree. See, I agree with that, but I don't know how we could have a federal top-down mandate because New York is not the same as Oklahoma. You know, and where I am in New Jersey is completely different than Texas. That you might know, be like, true, but like something simple, like every single person going to public areas should be forced to wear a mask. I don't think it matters what state you're from. Like that should be a thing. Or even you could also have like state by state guidelines that they're forced to follow certain guidelines um, depending on the number of active cases reported per day as a percentage of city or state. Like any, any type of response like this would be superior to what we're doing right now, which from the top down is literally nothing. You don't, you don't think Trump's doing anything? Well, he's not. No, we haven't. There is no there is no federal top down guidance on um, or, or authority on like how states should be handling like lockdowns and stuff. Because, I mean, right now, I know they're already talking about locking down my state again. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we, we barely fully open. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like, we're, we're still at 25 percent capacity on dining. Mm-hmm. Uh, most schools are, are pretty much shut. I mean, my kids go to a private school, so they're 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 open. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they're shutting down all the time. Like they just shut down for two weeks a little bit ago, just because one kid came up positive. So, I mean, how how is it that that Trump or Biden could could put a federal mandate on on how schools open when that's usually something that's left to local school boards? 
Uh, well, I mean, it wouldn't be left. So, I mean, like the first thing they could do is you could put pressure on Congress as president to pass some type of legislative action to do it, assuming that the president can't do it, which I think is, I think we're still up for debate on whether or not that's the case. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that would be like the, the first step. If, if nothing else is possible, like executively, then then force Congress to pass some kind of legislative, some kind of emergency bill to um, allow the federal government to give top down guidelines on this is what states ought to be doing right now to control if for no other reason for the for the health and safety of our country. But I mean, do you do you really think it's that out of control that 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 this is necessary? Yeah, we reported we're reporting record numbers of cases day after day after day. We went from but posting all time highs in the stock market to all time highs in the in the case reportings. Like, yeah, I, I don't like the stock. I don't consider the stock market to be a good barometer of how the economy is doing. Sure, anyway. of course not. I'm just saying that like we're like we are fucking up hard right now. Like you, like you think we're we're you think we're headed for the whole dark winter thing? We well like. We're not even on our second wave because we never even really got over the first one. Yeah, and we're coming up into the winter months. We, we heard this is going to be gone in summer, and we're reporting record numbers of cases, which means in the, in the following weeks we're probably going to start seeing the death tolls increasing as well. Like, I have, but, but, I mean, we haven't seen a, a real dramatic increase in deaths. So not I yet, mean, but that's because we're just recently starting to spike up more and more in cases. But you typically you see the deaths follow like like anywhere from like ten to fourteen days after, right? It still takes a while. Well, what about the whole herd immunity argument? Because, I mean... Herd, herd immunity? Few... It requires like 70% infected people or some shit, right? We're at like 3%. It does, but, here's, but here's the point. is that I've, I've spoken to a lot of public health experts on this, and they say that the best thing we could do is let 20-somethings get it. Well, I, wait, like... that is not true. Every single health expert that has publicly spoken on this has said that herd immunity, the idea of getting herd immunity through this is a myth. That is not true. The only people that talk about herd immunity are politicians that are ignoring and choosing to ignore the advice of health experts. Now, it's possible that there is some random crazy fucking doctor somewhere that blah, 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 says, but no head of any health institute, nobody in the CDC or the NIH or nobody in, in uh, the United Kingdom. I, I have not heard any like public reputable health experts talking about this. I mean, there's, there's been a few, but I mean, you are right. There are, have been none from the NIH. There have been none from the CDC. But I'm not. I'm also not sure if those people are permitted to to speak out in in any way that would disagree with what their agency says. And I'm not saying that as a conspiracy theory. I'm saying that that that's how any agency functions. Well, is if if the the, the people have to follow for, from the boss. So this is my question, I guess. Um, sure. America is supposed to be like a really great country. Um, mm -hmm. We should be able to do great things. So Agreed. why is it that countries like New Zealand or Australia or South Korea or Vietnam, these guys didn't have to do herd immunity. These guys didn't have to have thousands and thousands of people die. Why do we have to? Why can't we follow their models? And you have to give me an answer besides we're different. No, I'm not going to give you an answer besides we're different. And, and I've the, the cases that you've mentioned uh -huh. in Asia, now Vietnam, um, I'm not sure about South Korea, but Vietnam, China, um, Cambodia, Bangladesh, they've all stopped reporting test results. Okay, let's say, I don't even know if that's true. I, I'm, I don't believe that's true, but let's let's say that that is true then. What about South Korea, Australia, New Zealand? I don't know about South Korea. So, so, so I'm, South I'm Korea has a highly dense population of, I think, around 55 million people, and they sure. crushed this. I want to say their deaths are in the triple digits. I, I'm, I'm not doubting you. I just, I just don't know about South Korea. I know New Zealand took some pretty draconian steps. To, to avoid it spread. And, and Australia did in anywhere where there was a peak. So I know that, that they also took some pretty draconian steps. Now, I'm not okay, but who's draconian now when these countries have reopened in large parts and are not reporting cases? Well, Australia has been, and, and New Zealand is actually talking about locking down again because they just popped another case like a little while ago. They, I think they've had like five cases in New Zealand, which, I mean, granted, they're very spread out. And they have a very small population, so... It's, New, it's New Zealand, not, I, New Zealand is not closing down again. They have not talked about that. That's not true. Also, Australia is open now. Are they? I thought they haven't yet. Uh, I, I, I know if they have, it's very recent. They opened once, and then they had to close down a little bit because Victorian cases were spiking, and then they got mm -hmm. rid of all the cases. They crushed it, and then they've reopened. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with doing things the right way. If they, if if a country can give us guidance on how something can be done. When, when you say the answer can't be, well, we're different, the one answer of, we can, well, we, we are different is that we don't have a compliant population. We're not a population that, that tends to all agree or disagree on anything. 
and it's very difficult to enforce a universal standard on people that won't accept it. Then we've lost the country. And this whole conversation is moot. I'm just waiting for the violent revolution, and hopefully those people are gone, I guess. I mean, we're already kind of in that. I mean, No, we're not seen... even close to that. <laughs> no, I said kind of. I, we're, we're, we're obviously not an open revolt. But, I mean, they're putting up, they're boarding up businesses right now just for Election Day. I mean... Sure, I, but I this is nowhere close. Like, thinking there's going to be some protests or riots on Election Day is nowhere close to, like, open, violent, civil war or whatever. But, like, what, what you're telling me is... is is do you believe that anyone is going to accept the results of these elections of this election? Um, it'll probably depend on how much it goes one way or the other. But I mean, eventually we'll get over it. We always do. We got over uh, Bush v. Gore, right? <laughs> you know what's funny is I I didn't think that the, I thought that that was going to lead to a lot more violence than it did. Like that was a pretty defining time in my life. Like I was in college at the time, and it, it was crazy because we had never seen like an election go more than like a day past election day, mm -hmm. and that was one that just didn't seem to end. Then the Supreme Court, like that, that was a big deal to me when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Now it almost seems like a cakewalk. But I'm just saying, like I, I don't believe that any segment of the population is going to be comfortable with the results of the election. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I, it's this is like a problem. I don't know why I would worry about this. Like, there's nothing we can do about this. We just see how it goes down. But like, I, I want to return to something you said earlier, which is incredibly sure. sad to me. You said that this is not a compliant population. Do you think that the United States is so lost that we can't come together and, and do something for the better of the country? Like, don't, no. don't, you, rem don't you remember, you're, you, you must remember after 9-11 how the country came together in ways that it never had before. People were talking about New York drivers were actually like nice and courteous to each other for the, like the first time ever. Like that people were a lot different in the days following that there was some sort of country unity. I think Bush's ap approval rating was higher than it ever had been. You don't think it's possible that Americans can't be weaponized their patriotism or something to come together for just like a few months to clean something like this up? That's, that's just impossible. We're the only country that can't handle that. So, number one, I live 10 miles outside New York City. I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. And, okay. and it was, you know what it was? I think that, that a lot of, of what we did on 9-11 was wasted because immediately after we wound up going into Afghanistan and Iraq and, and causing this massive quagmire. And now nobody has any kind of faith that they're doing the right thing. Like 9-11, we were a united people. And it almost shows why we shouldn't have been because of the way that our politicians took advantage of us right after that unity service. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I think that do I think we're capable of coming together as a nation to accomplish something? No, I, I really don't. I, I, I don't I don't think we see each other as opposition anymore. I think we see each other as enemies. Um. OK, well, I mean, that's a pretty dim review of things. So I don't really know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a dimmer view. Oh, I just, dimmer. I, I sorry, doomer. Like it's very like no. nihilistic. No, because I, I don't I don't see that as being necessarily a bad thing. I, I don't think I'm not one of these people who thinks mass violence is on the way and that we're going to wind up shooting each other in the streets and all of that. I just think that there's eventually going to be a separation. Okay. I, I, I don't believe that America can remain 50 United States for that much longer. OK, I don't I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I think that's fantastic to believe that. But I mean, I guess we'll see. Right. I mean, what, what do you say by any time soon? I'm saying in the like next within the next years. hundred years, I don't think that we're going to be breaking off. We might add states, but I don't think we're going to have states like breaking off or anything like that. I, th I think that we're not going to have any option. I, I, I really don't. Okay. Well, hopefully Biden unifies the country in unprecedented ways. And we don't have to worry <laughs> about that, I guess. Listen, I mean, but but I want to ask you, because I'm, as I said, I, I respect your opinion on these things because I, I actually, I watch your stuff and I, I watch your reasoning on these things and you don't seem to be completely out of your mind when it comes to it. How does it not bother you that Biden has trouble putting together like complete sentences, that he doesn't seem to really have the <laughs> grasp on what's going on around him. People say that, but it's just not true. If you watched his last debate performance against Trump, he was, and this I is did. surprising to me, he was more articulate than Trump in that conversation, which I didn't know Biden even could be, to be honest, because Trump usually has the upper hand in those types of exchanges. But I thought that Biden was incredibly coherent during that debate. And these aren't scripted, prepared answers. These are live things formulated as hadn't given. So, I mean, I think that Biden has the capability to speak as well as anybody. Um, if we want to point to random stuff like that, I mean, I can point to Trump needing like an escort to, to walk down a ramp so he doesn't fall over and hurt himself or Trump not being able to raise a glass of water to his lips. But I don't think that dwelling on like the, the, the mental capabilities of any individual like that does anybody well. I think that people get way too hopeful that somebody's going to like lose their mind or some dumb thing like that is going to happen. I don't know. People did it with Hillary and I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not raising like that, that I think he's going to lose his mind. I look at it this way. I don't want Kamala Harris as president. 
Like I'm 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 more comfortable with a Biden presidency than I am with with a Kamala. Like Kamala Harris is just as bad as Bernie Sanders, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And I don't want a Mike Pence presidency either. Okay. But when I look at when I look at like Trump is a, a 74 year old, pretty morbidly obese guy. Like, I mean, he, I think he's at right now the oldest president that's ever served. But if Biden wins, he'll be the oldest president that, that's ever served. OK, so it, it's a legitimate argument that we have to look at what could happen in the next four years. Well, I mean, it's and, a legitimate argument, but I mean, I, I guess. But only if I didn't like Kamala Harris, I take Kamala Harris over Trump, too. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, that's an easy one for me. But what, I mean, what does Kamala Harris speak to you on? I mean, as I said, you seem to be an avid capitalist. Like I, I would consider myself less of a capitalist than you. OK, so I mean, and she's she's as committed to socialism as, as they get. Like, I don't think anybody in the mainstream Democratic Party, I, if you're looking for socialists, you have to go very, very far left. You have to go to like AOC and the squad to get to anybody that's remotely socialist. Kamala Harris is not even remotely socialist. But Kamala Harris sponsored the Green New Deal with AOC. Like, I mean, they she she speaks to socialized medicine. She she just released a video today that was all about uh, equity instead of equality and and all of that. Like, I mean, she she speaks to the socialist wing of the party. She's been rated the most liberal senator in in the Senate by quite a few outside organizations. Yeah, I guess it depends on how we define socialism. I mean, I guess if you're talking, if your idea of socialism is the government doing stuff, then I, I mean, I support that idea of socialism, I guess. If you're talking about the idea of abolishing capital and private property and making so the workers own the means of production and everything, I'm not in favor of that, but I don't think Kamala Harris is either, so. I don't even think that actually like AOC and all them really are. I mean, I, th I think that, that AOC mm. and, and Elon Omar are- AOC more and Bernie are definitely closer to that. Bernie and AOC literally promoted a bill, I think, that would have made it so that every company had to give 20% of its shares to like distribute it between its workers or something like that. Like they were definitely closer to that actual socialist stuff than Kamala Harris wanting, uh, you know, like public option for healthcare. Well, I mean, she doesn't, she wants Medicare for all. I mean, she, she co-sponsored the bill. Yeah, so she, that, yeah, sure, she may, yeah. but I mean, like, she's not going, that's not going to happen because the Democratic Party rejected Medicare for all. The Democratic Party typically wants the public option, or as Pete Buttigieg says, Medicare for all who want it. But I mean, like, how, how do you feel about Biden with, let's say, gun rights? Because I know, I know we, we spoke about. Oh, this yeah, the here. Democrats suck on gun rights, but I don't really care that much about them. I like guns. I think they're fun, but that's, that's not like a killer deal for me. Like, if I have to choose between gun rights and having like a public option, like, I'll throw my guns away in an instant. Like, I, I guess okay, that's well, an that's easy fair one enough, for me. Then. I, I, th I thought it was a big deal, too. No, I like guns. I think they're cool. I think that they're way, 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 way over talking pointed. Like, I don't I don't think gun shit is that relevant to any part of America, to be completely honest. Um, I, like, but, but it's just when it happens, it's incredibly fucking vocal and incredibly fucking visceral. Like, nobody wants to think of kids being killed in schools or, you know, hundreds of people being killed at a single point in time. But compared to other issues, I think by the numbers, I don't think gun stuff is that important. But it, but it's just it's a big selling point for Democrats. Whatever. But yeah, but but I also like I just don't care that much about about it like if somebody said i had to you know throw my glock or whatever it's like eh, whatever i don't care it sucks but eh. <laughs> like if, if it's between that and joining the rest of the first world the rest of the developed world with things like uh public health care then yeah fuck it see i'm just uh, th this is one of those times where i don't think that american exceptionalism would work like i i don't believe that the the way that our protections are raised through a constitution mm -hmm. that we can have a public option that will work why not Number one, legal protection. Our constitution gives us a right to sue over anything that that is a higher value than I think thirteen dollars. Okay. So if if the public option is that the public is running healthcare, then the public is going to have to deal with the lawsuits that come from all medical malpractice issues. And we're well, already the, the, about the public already deals with that. The public already deals with all sorts of malpractice. I mean, look at New York. New York spends. This is a surprising figure, and I can't even believe I'm quoting this because I didn't believe it until I looked it up. That New York City spends a quarter billion dollars a year settling lawsuits for the publicly funded police department. So we already do a lot of like legal related stuff for publicly funded stuff. It's not like that's not there's no precedent for that in the United States. So, and then we've already got like right Medicare. Now, what? An, an individual doctor in, in the United States has to take out about two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars in medical malpractice insurance just to cover the lawsuits that they're hit with. Okay. If that all becomes on the government in order to provide, I mean, we're 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 talking about trillions of dollars in liability that will now be on the government as opposed to being on private insurance companies. Okay. I, I mean, I mean we'll have to figure it out. I mean, like we. Everybody else has figured this out. We have to. This is embarrassing for me to not have 
to not have this figured out. I don't know why. I'm an American. I think that this country is very exceptional. Um, I think that there are things that we can do. Uh, I don't know why we keep making excuses. Um, we fucking killed it in World War II. Uh, you know, we've done amazing fucking things. <laughs> we put people on the fucking moon. Uh, we figured out so much crazy shit. We invented the fucking automobile. We used to lead the world in science and technology and education. People from all over the world still come to this country to get educated in the United States. The idea that we just, we're just too dumb to figure out how to get, I just reject that. It's embarrassing to me. Um, and as somebody that has like an international audience and as somebody that has a son like it's just it's it's embarrassing to me to have to continue to make excuses for why we can't do something that every single other developed country has done um, I reject the idea that we're just so exceptionally worthless or stupid that we can't do it I reject the idea that we can't pass some bill or some legislation let us do it like everybody else has figured this out it would make the country better off it would make our it would make our people better off it would make our economy better off okay sick workers and all that shit waste time in, in the economy we generate less revenue like this is just like this is such a non-issue I like I don't want to have to ever debate or argue about this like we should have some form of at the very least like a public option like we should be done with it we should have moved on from this issue a long time ago i don't know why we fight it i don't know why the majority of people that do fight it are people that can't afford health care anyway like I, I don't know i just i, I don't understand the, the huge fight against it so i uh, there, there's a lot that i can answer in that one yeah i also believe in in american exceptionalism to the point where i think that we can figure out private insurance i think that that we've made a lot of big mistakes and i think one of the biggest is tying it to our jobs because it's not portable. Mm -hmm. So a person can't switch careers without av actually having to consider that they might lose their health care. Yep. You know, and so I, but I think that we can figure out private insurance. I've lived under a socialized system. I lived in Israel for 11 years and they have, they have a completely socialized system. One that's considered one of the better ones. And I'll tell you, it's great until you have a kid that has an interest, like a more intricate problem than just the everyday doctor can fix. And I, I had two. One, I had I had a daughter that had trouble walking, and my son developed RSV with like a severe case of asthma, which which made him he had to go to the hospital like three times in the first six months. And I'll tell you, getting to a specialist, getting to someone who could figure things out was next to impossible. Now, if, if you if you were sick, it was the greatest system on earth because if you had like bronchitis, you called up the doctor, you went and saw him for five seconds, it cost you five bucks, and you what you went out with an antibiotic prescription, there was no problem. Same thing, like, I mean, up to, like, pregnancy was was great. My, my, my wife still rails about how great their, their system was. But when it came to anything complicated, it became much, much worse, like, way worse than we have it here. Like, they had, they had five MRI machines in the country, and they ran 24 hours a day. And when you need an MRI, they'd go, okay, next January is your date, Saturday at 3 in the morning. And that was it. You, there was no other way you can get an MRI. So here's my personal experience. Um, my kid's mom had a really bad cough for months and it took us three separate doctors that we had to go to from three separate hospitals to the, for, for the final doctor to finally give her the correct diagnosis. She had stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. It, I'm it, sorry it, it took, my, my brother-in-law had that. I'm yeah. Sorry yeah. Don't be sorry. She survived. So, um, but like it took us like over a month of shopping around at doctors to actually get that diagnosis. Um, this idea that like, because doctors are privatized, that they're like so much better and more amazing in the United States. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's true. And then also as much as people don't like to say it, uh, or, or as much as Republicans don't like to admit it, I guess access is important. Um, I have moles on my body. I'm, I turned 30 years old and it's like, Hey, maybe I should just go get like a, go get them checked out. Cause people say that when you start to turn 30, you start to get health issues checked out. And I remember that when I went to a, I don't even remember what the name of the doctor is, but it was basically a doctor that looked over my body, checked all my moles. And then he talked to me about potentially, um, getting a biopsy for one on my back. But he said that if I wanted to get that biopsy, it was going to cost me about $150. And he asked me if I could afford it at that time. So I can afford it. I don't care. I'm rich. Okay. Whatever. But if I was a poor person, and my life was coming down to whether or not I had the money to afford the doctor to take a sample of some tissue and test it. I mean, how good is my healthcare if I can't afford it, right? I don't disagree with you that America has the best healthcare in the world. We absolutely do. People fly from all over the world to get operations here, but that doesn't mean anything if people can't access it, right? So, but, I mean, and, and then like this really idea to have... this, this idea with like, 
you know, um, like, oh, well, the doctors are just not good, blah, 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 blah. I mean, we can look at cancer survival rates around the world. We can look at infant mortality rates around the world. We can look at all these diseases. It's not like America kills it, right? Notice how it's never a Republican response. You always hear these talking points where it's like, oh, well, when it comes to these issues, you know, it's hard to find a doctor. I know that's not true because if it was true, you wouldn't be telling me a story about your wife. You would be saying, well, why is America's cancer survival rate 400% superior to uh, the general Europe's, to other OECD countries? Why is it that we have, um, you know, like hypertension or heart rate, blah, 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 why is it that we are leading the world in all these health outcomes? And you tell us, how, that, but that's not true. And everybody knows it. So that's why we always have to go to these personal stories because we know that the numbers aren't on our side. I, I honestly, I, I don't have an answer to that because I don't look into the, the overall numbers on it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I look more into the, the, the philosophy of it in that I, I don't trust the government to handle these kind of things. And I also what, know- What, you what, trust private companies? Why? Recourse. In, in all honesty, so, I can so sue that's, a private company, so, and I know that I can get some level of justice. So, whereas suing the government, you never get shit. First of all, you so you can sue the government, and you could be more likely to get money from the government than a private company because guess what? <laughs> if a private company goes bankrupt, you're fucked. I got scammed. I, I don't know how long you've been in the streaming game. You ever heard of Owned TV? <laughs> No. Oh, a competitor to open up a Twitch a long time ago. I switched it over to them for a while. They didn't pay me for a single for a single subscription subscription I ever had, okay? That company went out of business. They owed me thirty thousand dollars. I don't get anything. I can't sue them. It's a private company. They're out of business. I can't sue any of the owners of the company or any of the people that made money off of it because hey, the company went out of business, so I'm shit out of luck. So the idea that I can hold a private uh firm more accountable than the government, that doesn't make sense. Also, the government is the ultimate form of accountability. I can vote out politicians. You can't do that with a private company. Like if Walmart fucks you over somehow, say you do so much and say you do win who cares it's not like the management is changing the owners aren't going to change you there's zero accountability for a private firm the only accountability they have is to their shareholders as long as their stock price isn't going down they don't give a fuck what people think about them so i, I don't know i don't i don't agree with that idea that there's no accountability in government when we can literally vote the people out but there is accountability in the private market where businesses can full like how much accountability was there in 2007 when wall street crashed like those um, were private companies there's no accountability there no, you have a good point. And I'm not going to argue that you don't have a good point. Mm -hmm. I'm just, um, I, again, maybe it's just I'm going by personal experience. I got injured when I was overseas. And again, I couldn't sue anybody because the government had a process. Mm -hmm. I got paid a certain amount of money and it wasn't close to enough to cover my injury. Mm -hmm. But it, but people that get hurt here, when they sue a private company, they at least get enough money usually to cover their injuries and, and pain and suffering and things like that. Hopefully. And I know. Hopefully, yeah. Obviously, every system has flaws. Mm -hmm. I just, I just see like when you when you look at the government taking over student loans, they're next to impossible to discharge in bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. You know, but any other loan you can discharge in bankruptcy. The government, when they say, okay, well, we're going to we're going to commit tax dollars to this, then you, they take away your ability to to in in any way, shape, or form get recourse. Um, I, I mean, I I guess, what do you mean by recourse? The idea that you can you can in a in an acceptable amount of time be heard in court or settle your case to a way that you can be compensated for a loss. I mean, like, but like one of the examples that I gave earlier that I was surprised about our government is that like, so in New York City alone, they settle like a quarter billion dollars a year of suits. Like, clearly there is recourse to be had when it comes to the government, and there's retribution too. You can vote them out. I, I don't know. I feels that feels like recourse to me. Like. I mean, I, I could probably be like something could probably be argued to me that on a local level, something might work. But the problem is healthcare can't work on a local level because otherwise what you're going to have is suburbs with superior medical medical care and cities with really shitty medical care. Sure. But I you mean, know? like that's like that's <laughs> kind of um, I mean, like you almost sort of advocated for something like that earlier. So I, I agree that tying health insurance to our jobs is bad. But getting these group pools is important for getting like good coverage. If we got rid of private insurance tied to our jobs and everybody's had to buy individual um, insurance shit, that stuff is expensive. I'm a relatively healthy, youngish person, and like even just for me, healthcare is like for the worst plan, highest deductible plan possible, like two hundred fifty dollars a month. That's that's a lot of money for some people, right? And for people with families, like you're looking at four figures sometimes. And if there's a health issue there, whew, that stuff can get really expensive really quickly. Um, so, I mean, like we would have to have some type of pool of people to draw from still. Um, and I don't know. This just being ran by the government just is so simple. It makes these things so much simpler to figure out. I, I, you see, I, I, just don't, I just don't see I mean, look, I'm not one of those people who says that Obamacare was just terrible mm -hmm. because for me, Obamacare is I, I'm, I've been a, an independent contractor for forever. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I've owned my own business since I'm 19 years old. 
So I've always had, to, since Obamacare started, I've had to get health insurance from the exchanges. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, I have so many dependents, I, I would literally have to be rich in order to to not qualify for Medicare for my kids. Like mm -hmm. they force my kids onto, onto Medicaid, I mean. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have that many complaints, to be honest with you. But again, I, I think that that's because it's being A, handled at a local level. I mean, New Jersey has, has a, a far superior Medicaid system than a lot of other states. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, as I said, I'm forced to take it, but I mean, I'm only paying, I think, $230 for me and my wife, though. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we have our deductibles, I think, like 50 bucks or something like that. So it's it's really it's not a bad system. I mean, I, I just think that that if you're going to mandate anything, it's better to mandate away from from being employer based because employers are always going to look to, to offer you the least amount of possible if they're forced to give it to you. Yeah, of course. If it's a negotiating point. If you're saying like, look, I won't work unless it's for $100,000 plus this level of insurance, fine. But if they're forced to give it to you, they're going to give you the shittiest option they possibly can, you know, in, in order to, to comply with whatever law they have to comply with. And, and that I think is, it's again, a broken system. I should be able to take my plan with me. If I have a plan that I think works for me and it costs X amount a month, and I want to go to another job and keep that plan. It shouldn't be that I have to go, okay, well, now it's $10,000 a month because my employer isn't covering part of it. Like, that should be a part of my negotiations with, with a new employer. Sure, which right. is why I like the idea of a public option. If you've got private insurance and you like it, or if you've got something for your job and you like it, yeah, you should be able to keep it. I don't think we should be taking away all of that or making private insurance illegal, like with Bernie's insane plans. But but why would you? Why would anybody offer private insurance if, if, if the public option is free? Um, I mean, it would depend on what, well, the public option wouldn't necessarily be free for everybody. Um, but like maybe, but even, even if I will, we'll, I'll, I'll go farther. Okay. Let's say that the public option is free. Um, maybe there are just some things that you want to pay extra for. Maybe when I go to the hospital, maybe I want to have, um, maybe I want to have fucking Asian massagers and music playing in the background or some crazy shit. I don't know. And there's like an extra up charge for that, that the public option doesn't cover. Then yeah, people should have the right to pay for extra shit if they want it. Or maybe like, maybe there's like MRI machines that, you know, you are, are more available quicker or something. Or if you want to, if you want to pay for access or something like that, I don't think that should be illegal. If people have the money for it and they want to spend it. That's fine. Or maybe you're like 94 year old grandma that gets like a fucking tumor. Maybe in the public option, like we don't have the money to pay for every single operation for people that are 150 years old. But if you have the private money, yeah, then pay for it. Like, I think that's fine if you want to do that. If you want like a private baby suite, yeah, if you're like pregnant and you want to have your own little special room with pink curtains or some shit to take your baby out, like, yeah, I think that stuff is okay. People want to pay for it. That's fine. Funny enough, that's that's actually how the system worked in Israel, is that if if you wanted, if you had a, an appointment to see a specialist, and let's say it was a month away, mm -hmm. you could see him privately, which meant you pay for it out of pocket, but but that's all it was. And you could probably see the guy the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, like they had certain amount of hours per day that they, they gave to private practice. Sure, yeah. So, and and I that I had no problem mm -hmm. with, because oh. I, I don't mind paying. To be clear... A lot of European countries do that. People always make it sound like Bernie Sanders' plan was in line with other European... That's not true. Bernie Sanders was proposing something that was far more radical than any European country has for healthcare. Um, so, yeah, I think that, like, having something that's more comparable to some of the multi-payer systems found across Europe, France, Germany, Italy, like, the, 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 that's fine. Like, the, if you want to pay for private shit, you can do it. But we have a public option for people that can't afford it. I... I I don't know how you feel. Maybe it's because I, ha I have a more international audience now. I have an international girlfriend that lives in Sweden. Um, I have a son. I look at the world and I look at my country specifically in a lot of different ways now. Um, like w the fact that we have so much wealth in this country and then we have people mm -hmm. that can't afford insulin. Like, I, like it's, it, it used to be something that was like intellectual for me. Like, oh, well, you know, the, the numbers make sense. If we produce this much, you know, goods and services, blah, 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 blah. But now it's more, it's a more visceral feeling. It's actually like embarrassing for me. Um, like when I'm driving around like LA with Molina and she like sees like under every single overpass, the tents and tents of homeless people. And she's like, holy shit, I thought that was just in the movie. I can't believe that. Like, that's actually embarrassing to me. I cringe physically. Or when Melina tells me that like, if she wants to go do testing, um, if we get regularly tested for like STDs, for her to do that in Sweden is literally free. She makes an appointment and she has to wait like three days for it. And if I want to do it in America, I've got to pay like $350 for the same test. Uh, and if I was poor, I just wouldn't be able to afford it. Um, I, that's, I don't know, that's embarrassing to me. Like, I don't think that my country should be like that. We should be able to do better than that. I, like, when I hear about the great things America's done, it's sad to me that I have to go back 10, 20, 30, 40 years to find that. And everything that we're doing currently is just so bad compared to the rest of the world. I don't know. I, I don't think it has to be that way. Well, I mean, there's a couple points. And, and I, I hate to use, like, one typical Republican talking mm -hmm. point, but it is it happens to be true. Sure. 
we innovate the best medical technology on the planet and we do that because of because of the the, the financial incentive yeah if, but if we can't we you don't think we can do that and you don't think there's enough wealth here that we couldn't continue to innovate on medical stuff and get like health insurance to people that don't have the money to pay for it. you know we can't do both like but i mean we have medicaid we have we have a system for people that can't afford it we have something for people below the poverty line but that doesn't cover all of the working class poor people that like, for instance, so for when, so we had to do so much random paperwork when me and Rachel were together, because when me and Rachel were together and we filed our taxes together, the way that our income was reported, I had to buy some of those cancer drugs. Jesus Christ. I remember one of the times we went to the hospital after Rachel got her diagnosis and there was like, there were some pills that we needed. I think it was literally $1,000 for one treatment of this pill that I bought for one day. And after that, I was like, okay, we, got, we, we have to get you on like fucking Medicaid because I can't afford this. But because of the money that I made, there was no fucking way. Cause I made, I think I was making like around like I think $110,000 that year. So like I'm not qualifying for any of that. But that just because I make like a, a very, very low six-figure income, that doesn't mean that I can pay thousands of dollars every single week for her cancer treatment, right? I have other bills and shit. Like I can't do that. So like, yeah, Medicaid exists, but that's like for the poorest of the poorest of the poorest of the poor. And it misses the entire working class that is making enough money to survive, but can't afford what are luxuries in the United States, like healthcare, which is crazy to me. But I mean... Again, I, I'm not I'm I'm not saying that we couldn't figure something out. I'm just saying that I haven't seen any any proof that our government is capable of figuring out shit. And the thing you said, like you drive past, you see the homeless tents and all that. Oh, OK, I agree that we could fix it. I'm just curious as to why we're not. I mean, it the, well, the first thing that it takes. Well, the, the first and second thing of any problem ever. The very first thing you have to do is you have to recognize that there's a problem. And for a lot of people, we can't even do that. A lot of people think that homeless people are there because they choose to be, because they're lazy. A lot of people think that every American could have health insurance, but people are just dumb or they don't know where to get it. Um, so we don't even recognize that it's a problem. And then once we recognize that it's a problem, then the political will has to exist in order to get things done. You know, A lot of kids, a lot of liberals talk about like, oh, like we should fix climate change. I want to fix climate change. Okay, cool. Well, will you donate a hundred bucks a month in order to do it? Like, oh, hold on, fuck no. Okay, I don't care about climate change that much, right? It's like, okay, well, do you care about it? Do you not, right? A lot of people will say things or look at the UK, right? I want to Brexit. I want to leave the EU. Okay, fine. That's cool. Um, well, here's how we're going to do it. No, here's how we're going to do it. No, here's how, okay, well, fuck. Like, I mean, what, what we need the, what are we, what are we, what are we going to do guys? Like, yeah, I, I mean like you have these problems that exist, but nobody's, it's very easy to say that I want to solve a problem. But then when it comes time to addressing like, okay, well, how do we actually solve it? And nobody wants to make a sacrifice for it, right? How many people, I remember hearing about this in my own city. How many people in Omaha are, are, are like, um, uh, you know, we need to fix our schools. We got to fix our schools. It's a shame that teachers get paid 40000 a year, blah, blah, blah. They have to buy school supplies. This is bullshit. We need to fix our schools. It's like, oh, okay. Well, uh, time to raise uh, property taxes like 1% so that we can like get some more money in the system. Like, nope, wrong. Voting that shit down. No fucking way you're going to touch property taxes. People, voters will crucify for you. That. It's like, okay, well, you guys want to fix things, but nobody wants to give anything to do it. I don't know. I, I, I just, I think. But we do do it here. That's why, that's why maybe, maybe that's why it's a, a foreign concept to me. I mean, I, I pay double in property tax what I do for my mortgage. So, and I mean, I, my kids go to private schools, so they get Wait, no hold on. I'm, wait, you pay double in property taxes than you do for your mortgage? Yep. I pay, I pay over $1,000 a month in property taxes. That sounds interesting. I can't, I can't argue with you. Obviously, if you're right, then you are. I just don't know. Yeah. Damn. New Jersey is a, a lot of people in, A lot of people in chat are saying New Jersey is insane. So, yeah. Okay. It is. It's just, it's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, we have great schools in my town. Mm -hmm. You know, and and most of the towns around me have great schools. Mm -hmm. And I don't live in like, like I live in a very working class town. There's there's no mansions in my town. Like a five bedroom is, is you know, unheard of in my town. Mm -hmm. But we have great schools, and that's because we 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 pay the money for it, and we've all made this kind of group commitment that this is something we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of the towns have, and even even the inner cities have made some level of commitment. Mm -hmm. to to better their school like my, my mother worked in she's retired but she worked in an inner city school like they put a shit ton of money towards the votech program because they they knew that it was necessary for the inner city kids mm -hmm. you know and and even a school that was was generally not the best because as a, all inner city schools are, are not generally the best they had one of the top votech pro programs in the country mm -hmm. you know and it's because they, they made we made that commitment to ourselves to do that and we have done it why so can't we maybe, we can't make that kind of commitment on like a country-wide level it's just not possible 
I don't know how we make because I mean, like, I, I have a friend who lives in Appalachia, right? Mm -hmm. Like, he he drives miles to to go see a doctor. Mm -hmm. There's no capital investment whatsoever into the poor of of the country. There there's there's plenty in the poor of New York City mm -hmm. or the poor in Newark or the poor in Chicago. But when it comes to the poor, the rural poor, there's no commitment whatsoever by anybody to mm -hmm. help them. So to make the national commitment, my problem is, is that the national commitment tends to prioritize one type of poor over another type of poor. And, and, and that doesn't work for me. Well, so like the reason why we prioritize some pores over others is because the cost per person to help is so much different, um, which sucks. And it's not really fair. But like if I if I were to if I could choose, like I could set up a hospital in some rural place in Nebraska or I could set up a hospital outside of like a suburb or something in New York City, like in Nebraska, that hospital might serve like 100 people within like a 50 mile radius. Whereas like if I set it up outside of like a major city, well, it's gonna serve way more. Um, and that sucks, but the only way that you can get help for those people is literally going to come through some sort of government investment because the private investment's not gonna be there because there's no incentive, right? Because it's, you're not gonna reach as many customers. But as I said, I, I could accept that if, if I saw it happening. If I saw the government, like, cause the government already pays a shit ton of money into the healthcare system, regardless of how private we wanna claim that it is. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there still is a massive investment by our government, especially when it comes to emergency room care. And they're not putting the money into the rural poor, regardless of what of how many people it will help. I mean, you but know? there are hospitals out there, right? And like or like the post office will deliver mail to any address in, in the U.S. So like, I mean, like it's there, right? No, the, I mean, the, their, their health care system is is wildly lacking. And because of that, their insurance rates are through the roof. Sure. Like, I, I mean, if you look. Go ahead. If you look at like the the rates through the Obamacare exchanges that I mean, you said you're you're from what Oklahoma? Um, I live like, in California now, but I'm from Nebraska, so that's what I'm. Nebraska. From, yeah. But when you look at the rates that people pay out there, like a single person who's who's not eligible for for subsidies, mm -hmm. they're ten thousand dollar deductible, a thousand dollars a month for insurance because there's one carrier, and and the services are so spread out that they're that nobody takes anything. You know, so it's it's almost it's almost like pointless to have an Obamacare program. Because, well, but like the only thing that would solve these cases, though, would be more government intervention. You'd have to get in there and force it down through like taxpayer money from across the country or at least across the state, because privately, that's never going to get solved for because there's just not money to to invest there to make money back. Right. But I mean, there does seem to be the money to invest there. If if, if the money was there to invest, I'm sure if people saw a result of their money, that they would be more than happy to do it. Like, I, I always say this, that the, if a government that actually worked on infrastructure is one that would probably never be unelected, you know, because people, when they when they see nice roads, when they see nice airports, when they see, you know, bridges that don't fall apart, when they see actual things that, that better their lives, they tend to have a higher trust in government. When, when you pay your taxes into a system where you don't actually see any results from your money, other than, than a kick-ass military, which, I mean, come on now at this point, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we we don't see the value in our investments, so we don't see the reason to make more investment, and that's why it's so hard to convince people that the government is actually there to to provide anything for you. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just depends on what it is you're looking for, like, um, and then also like the investments that we make, we don't always see them because they're not always for us. So, for instance, people talk about how much of a failure like Obamacare is or the ACA. Um, the ACA didn't do anything to help prices. That's 100% true. Nobody can ever deny that because it didn't. However, the ACA made healthcare available to some like 13 million people that didn't have it before. Like those Agreed. people's lives were demonstrably improved by having access to the ACA. Like without the ACA, these people are fucked. That, well, I do agree with you on that. It also increased costs for a lot of people that were perfectly happy with their health insurance plans. Sure, it did. And, and it, it wasn't perfect. And it did it. And they were, the cost of health care has continued to increase. It was before the ACA, to be clear. Also, a lot of that increase in cost, too, was because of it, because the ACA brought in line a lot of medical insurance with what it was supposed to be doing before, regardless. So, for instance, not only people always talk about things like pre existing conditions, but there were also mm -hmm. a lot of companies that would weasel out of paying for, um, we, we a lot of paying claims when they were um, when people tried to make claims because of like random bullshit like the ACA made a lot of that those kinds of practices illegal or made it so that if you're health insurance you have to cover some basic things because you could get insurance before and there would be like no copay or any help on like prescriptions or no copay or any help on like basic doctor visits it's like well what the fuck is the point of this so the ACA got rid of a lot of those like really shoddy plans which also also drove the price up a little bit as well sure but um yeah I mean it, it didn't help for price no one should ever debate that point it, it definitely like things have continued to get more expensive but again like it's not like what we had before was any better like 
there were still tons of people that just weren't ever covered by anything. It's like it's so bad. I you see, I I, I agree that I agree that that you have a point, and mm -hmm. and I think that that that's one thing you can credit the ACA with is that it moved the goalposts. Mm -hmm. No one is talking right now about changing any type of of government program that will get rid of pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where no one's talking about going back to a time where they could deny you for pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, whether even if it, even if the, the, the Republicans got their dream proposal, it would still be a proposal where a, a risk pool was created for people with with pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. Right. Because because no one would stomach that right now. No yeah. one would stomach going back to that's that system. But how much did we lose in in doing that? And th and that's the question that, that I continuously go for. And again, I come back to guns because it, it is a big issue with me. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that I can protect my family. I, I like the fact that, that the rest of the country values the fact that I can protect my family. And being in a blue state, I've always been told, well, why do you need this? Why do you need that? The police will protect you. The police will protect you. And I've always said, because the day could come where they won't. And I don't want to have to argue that I need to take this right back. You know, it was given to me for a reason. I believe in that reason. And now I look at what's going on and I think, thank God I had that reason. Because the police aren't protecting people in a lot of different areas. You know, police are letting shit get burned to the uh, to burn to the ground. Police are letting these riots happen. Like they're boarding up half of D.C. right now just over an election because they're afraid that they're going to burn down half the city. Like for me, I would rather the government stay out of that right because losing that right, I know I'll never get it back. And and that's so, kind of where I feel on a lot of these different things. There's a really, really, really good speech. Um, you're familiar with Scalia, Antonin Scalia or whatever, the of late course. justice. Um, he has a really good speech in front of Congress having to do with um, rights. And one of the things he talks about is that like, r like rights on paper don't really mean anything. That there are other For countries sure. that have existed, like the USSR, that had a far superior constitution uh, to the United States. There were way more rights that were delegated out specifically in these texts than anything our Constitution provides for. Um, but the difference is, in, in the United States, we have strong institutions that guarantee those rights. And that at the right. end of the day, yeah, your rights come down to the institutions that exist to protect them, not just what's on paper. So when somebody tells me that we have all these freedoms in the United States and all that, and we do have a lot in some ways that I think are really cool, and I appreciate that, I'm trying to think of it from the perspective of somebody that can't afford things. How much do these rights matter. So for instance, if we made it so that every single gun in the United States cost $20 million, does your right to own a gun actually exist at that point? Like, no. yeah, like you, you can, like you, you can go out and buy one, but if you can't afford it, well, who the fuck cares? Like that, that right delegated to you literally means nothing. And I, I look at like other services related to that in the same way. Like, yeah, it's cool that we can own guns, but like, I think that there are probably more people on the planet that want like healthcare and a good education for them and their children than people that want to own guns to protect themselves. Um, and again, to be clear, I love guns and I don't think anybody should fuck with them. Um, but like to, to, to talk so fervently ab about firearms and how important it is for every American to possess a firearm, um, like as a, I've never had a moment in my life with my son, Nathan, where I felt like I needed my Glock 17 to make his life better. But my son also was, he has a Vanderwood syndrome, had medical problems growing up. And man, dude, we had him in all sorts of speech therapy and, and, and a lot of like examinations if he needed surgery. Um, if I was a poor person, I wouldn't be able to afford any of that. My, my son would just be fucked. He would just, he would be talking like a retard throughout all of his schooling. And he'd just be fucked if we couldn't afford any of those extra services. And all I can think of is because I'm a big streamer now and I make a lot of money now. But before this, when we were pregnant, when we had him, I cleaned carpets professionally. If I would have carried through with that same job, all the freedoms in the world that are promised to me by my American constitution wouldn't have meant anything for my son that would have just grown up with a massive speech impediment and, and potentially a fucked, you know, physiological problems because I wouldn't be able to afford any of the treatment for him. And I don't know, that really fucks with me. That like, that super bothers me that if I don't have money, I lose my rights in the United States, that it's a country for the rich. You see, I, I, I can hear that a little bit. I, the, there, there's a level of sympathy I have to to it, but at the same time, the market is what usually drives costs down. The market is, I mean, people like to talk about about ulcers, right? The, in in the '80s, having an ulcer was like I think one of the top medical problems that that wasn't fatal in the United States, and it would cost like forty to fifty thousand dollars to to have your ulcer treated surgically. Now you take a pill. You know what I'm saying? And that pill, like, yeah, it might cost a dollar and that might be sound like a lot per pill, but it's much better than $40,000 for a surgery. And we couldn't do that, I don't believe, if if we had a government-run system. It's I possible, but so... 
something that we have to think about for what do markets do? Markets don't, aren't there for the public good. Markets are there to for the re- private good. I agree well, with yeah, that. To, yeah. So when I played, I used to play StarCraft two professionally a long time ago. And um, I gave lessons for people because people do that, believe it or not, for video games. They'll buy lessons from famous people because they want to hang out with you for an hour because they want to blah, blah, blah. So here's what I noticed with my scheduling, okay? If I scheduled 20 lessons, I could schedule them for $20 an hour, okay? 20 lessons for $20 an hour. But what I noticed was that if I raised my prices to $40 an hour, I'm going to get way less buyers. I'll get 10 buyers, okay? But would I rather sell $20 of lessons for 20 hours or would I rather sell $40 of lessons for 10 hours? I'll make the same amount of money, but I have to do half the work in the other one, right? So when mm-hmm. we talk about things like healthcare, right? Healthcare in a private industry isn't solving for the public good. It's solving to maximize costs. If I can sell 10 services to 10 people, or I can sell 10 services, or, or services to 10 people for $1,000, or services to 1,000 people for $10, I'm better off going with the fewer people at the higher profit margin because I'm gonna make more money doing it. Like, I don't think that a private system ever is designed to maximize the public good. That's just not what markets do, and that's fine. I don't think markets should do that. That's just not how markets work. But I think we have to recognize the, the powerful parts of capitalism is that, well, capital is allocated incredibly efficiently in ways to make money. But I think it's our job as the government to kind of guide those people so that they're making money in effective ways that benefit society. I, I, think, like, that's a, I think that's an important concept to understand, that just because markets are powerful and markets exist doesn't mean that markets solve for the public good. They only solve for the, for, the, for the stakeholders or the shareholders of that company. And it's not all the time that those shareholders, that their goals are going to be aligned with the public good. I, you see, I agree with that. I just don't, I don't understand. I don't believe the government has proved an effective tool of aligning with the public good either. But they do. I mean, Medicare and Medicaid are, you said it yourself, are incredibly popular programs. That I don't hear people complain about it. Like Medicare and Medicaid are incredibly popular public programs. Like they just are. I hear people complain about me. I'm just saying I don't, mm-hmm. but that, that could be because where I live, like, I mean, they're, they're, I'm, I'm in a very densely packed state. Mm-hmm. So I, I know a lot of people have problems with Medicaid and finding providers that'll take it. Um, the providers are limited here as well, but it's just, there's so many of them that I, I haven't had a problem, you know? Mm-hmm. And look, there's something to be said. It's nice going to the doctor, giving a card and then never worrying about paying for anything. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what, what Medicaid provides. Because I mean, when when I take my kids to the doctor, I hand them the card. I mean, maybe there's a five dollar copay, mm-hmm. or it's not anything like astronomical. But they they pay for it. You know, my my one daughter needed braces; it was paid for. Like, I mean, if I had private insurance, that would have cost me thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, and and as I said, this isn't a case of me wanting to be on Medicaid. I'm not allowed to to get my kids private insurance mm-hmm. unless I want to pay three thousand dollars a month for it. Yeah, because the exchanges won't allow me to because of the amount of dependence I have. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, I, I don't argue that it's a bad system. I just don't argue that it's an optimal system. I, I argue that it's a system that winds up costing. I mean, I think what a, a more than half our budget, national budget goes to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Well, I, I mean, like our that's under our non discretionary spending, um, and it is a large amount. The entitlements are huge. However, um, Social Security is a system that we also pay into, right? So it makes sense that it, a lot of it would be paid out as well, right? Um, but, but I mean, like, if you look at, like, the total amount of per capita healthcare expenditure in the United States, it's huge. Like, we, we blow past every other OECD country, um, and we don't get anything for it. Like, I think we spend, like, twice as much as the next country on our health care, and not everybody's covered. We have no paternity and maternity leave. Our survival rates for any major diseases aren't really any better than any other European countries. Like... I don't know, like, what's, like, what do we get for our money? Like, when people talk about, like, how efficient or inefficient our system is, like, that's one thing that I look at. Money in, and then outcomes out. And I look at the outcomes, and I look at the money in, and something clearly is not working here. And all these other countries, with all these private, or I'm sorry, with all these public uh, options or single-payer systems, all seem to run so much more efficiently than ours in terms of cost to outcome. I mean, uh, cost to outcome, I don't know how true that is, because, I mean, when I, when I lived when I lived overseas, right? Mm-hmm. I paid 40% of my income in taxes and that money never came back. There was no tax refund at the end of the year. There was no, you know, earned income child tax credit or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It was 40% out of my paycheck and that was it. Mm-hmm. Here, I mean most years I get back more than I put in. And so do most people to tell you the truth. Like until you get to a certain income level, 
like you get back way more than you put wind up putting into the system in your tax refunds. Wait, Especially that's kids. generally not true. Um, that can be true at very, very low income levels um, through things like, I don't know if the child tax credit is refundable, but I know that the earned income tax credit, the AITC, I know that that is refundable. So it's possible that at very low incomes with dependents um, that you could be getting back more than you pay in. But that's only true at like very, very, that's only true at low income levels with lots of dependents, I think. Like gener generally, I mean, that's not me, true. Mm -hmm. but for, I, I just, I have so many dependents that like low income is very relative. Mm -hmm. Like I, I make low six figures, but I still because of the amount of dependents I have, I still get back, you know, quite a bit of money. Sure. Like, so, but I'm just saying that a lot of times what we consider as to what we're paying into the system, we're not actually paying into the system. Like most people get even some of it back. Let's say they get 50% of what they put in back, you know? So if you're paying 25% and then you get 50% back, you're paying 12 and a half percent. All of a sudden, like, that's not really the same amount going in. And it's not really like, what am I getting for my money? In most other countries, the amount they pay into the system is is huge in relation to the amount of money they take home. So I'm just saying that we're 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 spending a lot of money, but that's because we're also not putting enough money into the system from our paychecks. And I think if you were to tell people that we were going to start putting money in like a percentage of income towards a, 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 a governmental health system, I think people will just say no. People freak the fuck out. Yeah, I mean, I guess in I, I was only talking, I don't know, like total taxes altogether in terms of putting money in and getting money out. I was only talking in specifically in regards to how much America spends on health care, that we spend a lot of money on health care and we don't seem to get much for how much we spend. Um, I, I was talking more specifically. So like, I think if you Google like um, America healthcare spending like uh, uh, per capita or whatever, that like our spending per capita is far, far, far above every other country, even with socialized healthcare systems. It seems like we spend more on healthcare related things, which is, which is confusing. It's confusing, but the number is also skewed. It, we have this retarded system here in this country where we allow for emergency rooms to take care of everybody, regardless of whether they can pay or not. And in an emergency room, you'll pay $80 for an aspirin. And, you know, like, God forbid, you're actually really injured and they have to do something for you. You're talking hundreds of hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars. Those things should be routine if you have health insurance, you know? Sure. But I mean, like, I mean, there's two things. One is every other country in the world is going to be like that. And mm -hmm. two, I mean, what is the alternative? If somebody shows up in an emergency room, do you send them away? And let no, them not at all. I'm just saying that that's a, a big part of what accounts for our, our massive amount of healthcare spending. I, I don't think that's a huge part of our spending. And also, other countries have to do the same. It's not like we're. It's not like if in if in Norway, if I get like sick or if I'm like dying and I go to an emergency room, they're like, "Can you pay? Nope, then get out." Right? No, but it's not like that. But what I'm saying is, is because their system is universal, mm -hmm. right? They don't pay eighty dollars for an aspirin in an emergency room, but eight dollars for an aspirin if you go into your your primary care doctor or you go to a oh, pharmacy. Oh, yeah, I agree with that one hundred percent. However, you know? like that's another reason for having like a universal system is because if people are covered and they're more likely to get like preventative care or routine checkups, then they're less likely to run into medical emergencies that's going to fuck over them or the economy. I you see, I that, I don't I don't have a problem with universal standards. I have I just have I have a problem with government bureaucracy that that always comes down to what it is for me. I also have a problem with if the government is the one who makes the decision who lives and dies. Mm -hmm. I always feel like they're going to make decisions that are going to wind up hurting more people than they're helping. Well, but like so people make this bureaucracy argument. I, I had a lot of like experience working with businesses and now like as clients or whatever. Mm -hmm. Large corporations have a lot of bureaucratic shit as well. I mean, like, I, I don't know, like, what industry specifically. We can talk about video games. We can talk about, like, other types of companies. We can talk about, like, gaming. I, I had a bit of experience in the casino industry. Um, like, this idea that large companies are these, like, Swiss Army knife, ultra-efficient, like, clockwork things. I, like, there's a lot of corruption and inefficiency and bureaucratic bloat in large companies as well. I don't think that they escape that. But what I'm saying, though, is that, like, when you look at when you look at the administrative cost of, of our government system, which is Medicare, Medicaid or our private system, right? The administrative costs are way less in Medicare, Medicaid. But when you look further into the numbers, it's because the majority of the paperwork that gets done in order to be reimbursed for Medicare, Medicaid is borne by the doctors. It's borne by the providers. That's why a lot of people won't take it. It has nothing to do with the with the rates at which they pay. It's the amount of work that you have to go through in order to get reimbursed, whereas private insurance is forced to do it all themselves. 
So they're forced to hire certain levels of administration that the government isn't because they just point it off on the doctors and make the doctors pay for it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, and it's that kind of like, like trickery, that kind of bullshit that makes me not trust the government system because the government's always going to try to look the best, not be the best. So I guess, so my question is, let's say, let's say that every single thing you just said is true. And and let's say that I grant you all of that. Then what is the solution? For me, the, the, I, I think the solution is more competition. But like, I think the problem wh- wh- is we don't have enough competition. Why is it, this just hasn't worked in the past? Like before, because we've never actually tried it. What were we doing before the ACA? Before the ACA, there wasn't a mass amount of competition because nobody tried to compete. Why not though? What, what's going to change compete. that? How are we going to get people to compete? Number one, let them compete across state lines. Do you think that's going to that solve was, that everything was, though? Like, no, but I think it helps. I think there's a lot of things that can be done to deregulate and to allow competition, and then we can take it from there. We can take it to the point where we could let the private market efficient, make it as efficient as possible until we're at a point where there has to be some level of regulation. And I, I'm not a person who believes that there's no such thing as a good regulation. You know, there, there are regulations that are fine, but you have to find that point as to where it's necessary to regulate because the, the deregulation has gone too far. And everybody, of course, in the chat is talking about the LASIK eye surgery. Uh, like um, example Mm -hmm. is that it, when it started, it it cost you know, $10,000 per eye, but private competition drove that cost. Now it's like 500 bucks per eye because the, the, the competition got so fierce for such a service that it got to the point where the innovation of the machines got so good that it got to the point where it didn't cost anything. And it's, it's something economists cite. I don't know how much I buy into that. It was just the LASIK eye surgery thing, but it, it's shown in dentistry and in, in, in eye surgery, which are, are not typically covered by health insurance, that competition has helped lower costs in the long run and produce better outcomes. Whereas I, I think that we could try that here. We've always tried more regulation and have just seemed to fuck ourselves up worse. Whereas I think we could try less regulation. And as I said, the regulators could come in at the point where we notice that deregulating is now causing more harm than good. I guess I would just, I guess I'd just be, I'd be warmer to that argument. It, it's just, um, what, what, it, what is like your, what's your work background? You, you know, I, I don't need to know your experience, but I'm just curious, like, what do you do for work approximately? Business development. I, I help companies that are going from small companies to getting investment, to getting government funding, to growing into larger corporations. Okay, awesome, cool. So my guess is that when you are probably, when you're trying to sell something to a company or when you're helping a company like walk through something, I seriously Mm -hmm. doubt that every single time you talk to a company, you are building from the ground up a completely new approach to every single thing. I'm sure that you probably know that like, hey, for a company of your size, this thing tends to work and we can modify this or this. Like you probably have a ton of blueprints that you work off of whenever you communicate with a given company because you know stuff that's worked in the past. You know what works, you know what doesn't work, right? I'm guessing. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And I guess that's just how I view, like, um, I know from a programming point of view um, and, and from, other, well, no, just sticking with this, like, t- typically when you're, when you're working with stuff, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Like, there are so many problems that we need to solve for in society. Like, why try something that no one else has tried when other people do things and we know that it works? And I, that's just how I view healthcare. Like, there are so many countries that have multi-pair systems that just have awesome healthcare outcomes. Everybody can afford healthcare, and that's awesome. Why try to take some radically different approach that could have incredibly negative or harmful side effects instead of just like just do let's just do what everyone else does and then we'll like figure out like some other cooler problem rather than like stressing over healthcare that every other country seems to have figured out but us and again I, again i i mm-hmm. hate coming back to your typical you know republican type argument but you're also you also have to accept that most other countries have a pretty homogenous population so it's a lot easier to standardize care and the one well, country what, where wait, they what, don't how, have a very homogenous population, which is Canada, are are drowning in their healthcare system. I don't know, like what, unless there's like I, I don't know if there's like fundamentally different types of care needed for different types of like non-homogenous people. Like what? Sure, there are because uh, there's different diseases that spring up from dis- different people. There's different levels of drugs that go to different people. There's different drugs that are targeted to different types of people. I, I, so I mm-hmm. don't think that, like, for instance, in the United States, I don't think that like black people or people with African ancestry being more predisposed to like sickle cell anemia is the thing that's driving up healthcare costs in our system. I, I have a hard time. Like I know that there are different groups of people with certain ancestry that can be predisposed towards certain diseases, but I don't think that that's like a major driver in the difference in healthcare costs. Like I, I don't, I don't think that's, it's, it's a difference in what's necessary to keep 
specialists in in different healthcare systems. When you have when you have a hospital that opens up in New York, it's serving a much different population than a hospital that opens up in Nebraska because the populations are so different. So it's very hard to standardize care on a national level when you're dealing with individual populations that are different, and that does drive up costs. And again, I, I wouldn't have such a problem with it if if I just had had the example that it, I mean. And Reagan tried this; it, it failed. He wanted to just provide catastrophic insurance, right? Because if you have to go to the doctor and you know get a, an antibiotic, it costs a hundred bucks out of pocket to go to the doctor. The antibiotic costs another fifty. You know, you should be able to, to afford. And if you're that poor that you can't, then you, you have something like Medicaid. You know, if you don't have insurance and you don't want to pay out of pocket, like whatever. But it failed because what they found was that that people that were going to regular doctors were getting recommended to specialists because they didn't have the money to pay the primary care just to go with a step higher and they could get their catastrophic insurance to cover it because they were going to a specialist. Likewise, I wonder if the opposite would work if you had to pay for, you know, if you if you were provided for basic health insurance, like that was something the government provided, but you had to pay for catastrophic insurance. You know, would that work? Probably not, because if someone gets into a car accident and doesn't have insurance, like you said, a hospital is not going to just boot somebody out on the street when they get pulled in, you know, with a broken neck. So I, I don't I don't know what the system is that would work that because britain it's not working they, they've had, they've had to import more doctors than they actually are training in, in their own country wait but that's first of all that's true in the united states as well that we have a massive shortage of medical professionals even though we pay ours more than any other country in the world and also i think in the uk i think i don't think anybody's talking about wanting to get rid of the nhs also they have an incredibly diverse population um like london i think is like 40 percent non-white people and their healthcare outcomes are about comparable with the rest of great britain like it's not like i i i, I just I don't buy as much into this idea that like different races of people need these like radically trained doctors that like a heart surgeon is going to cut into like the chest of Hispanic male. And it's like, fuck, I forgot the hearts on brown people are on the right side. And, and for white people, still. like, I, I don't think that the training is that much different or like the level of specialization, like, oh, like I can operate on brown and Asian humans and I can operate like I, I, I don't think I, I don't think it's that different. I, I mean, I stand to be corrected if there's like some medical professional chat. It's like, actually, it's dramatically different. But I, I would be surprised if that was the case. I'm saying it just adds to cost. The, I, I wasn't yeah, saying it's it a, a adds to cost the same way that like getting a different trim on your seat in a car might add to cost, but it's going to be inconsequential compared to the overall price of what you're paying, I think. Like to have a doctor trained that might be like a little bit more sensitive to the differences of potential diseases between people. Like and this is stuff that doctors should be trained about anyway. You should always be looking for stuff like this. Uh, because like for instance, like sickle cell anemia, that that's not something that affects black people. That's something that affects uh, that affects people with a certain like gene with that that tend to be predominantly black, but not all the time. It's, they, they, they can appear white and still have um, the, the gene required to develop that disease. And they could be black and not have the gene required to develop that disease. Like there's all sorts of things like that that medical professionals, there's a reason why med school is so grueling and arduous and there's so much you have to learn as a doctor for diagnostics, but yeah. I mean, that's also a huge problem in our country is that, it, and I know this is a problem in most countries, but in ours mm -hmm. it's especially acute, is that we don't have enough spaces in med schools. And we that's by design. They, they don't want to put out too many doctors. Wait, you know, why not? Why do why doesn't the AMA want more doctors? Yeah, or why would you think it lowers it lowers the the profit margins on the ones that are out there? The, the, they don't want to flood the market like they do with the lawyers. Wait, I think and, I think aren't schools all the time asking for more like people to enroll for like healthcare shit? I thought that was the thing that like no, colleges it's are really hard to get into med school. I mean, like they turn down, I think eighty percent of people that apply to med schools. You, but isn't that generally on grading? That's not because they're just trying to artificially drive up. No, I'm saying like the in order to get into med school, you have to, it's not because just because of grading. The grading system is so high that you really have to be an exceptional student to to get one of the coveted places. It's it's not that there's the, that everybody who can't get in can't make the make the cut. It's that the amount of people that apply there's only so many spaces. So it's just it it cuts out a lot of people. A lot of people in, in America are going to med school in the Caribbean. They try to get in, in in Israel or in or in Britain or in any place because there's there's so limited amount of spaces here. It's it's been a problem for a long time, even long before the ACA actually. Mm -hmm. hmm. <clears throat> but again, and and this is this is what I always come back to though is that all of these problems have been known for a long time and nobody's tried to fix them. You know, it's 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 almost like okay, do we start like okay, we've decided we're going to go with this government option, but we can't seem to fix the little shit let alone fixing the big stuff. Sure. 
yeah, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of work to be done, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. Real quick, let me read two super chats. Yeah, CT001 for, for six ninety nine. Mother Nature doesn't want everyone to live. That's why she created diseases to weed out the weak and unfit. You see it in all species and life forms. Whatever with that, I, I probably agree, but that's irrelevant to the conversation. If that was true, ninety nine percent of the people watching this conversation, and probably you and me included, or maybe you're a better survivalist than I am, would probably be dead. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think I could survive in the wild. Uh, I can't. I can't cook food um, from like a dead deer or whatever, or do the necessary shit to build a shelter. I couldn't do that. But yeah, I could do all that, oh, but okay. I also have to take five little kids with me everywhere mm -hmm. I go. So sure. good, good chance I would be alone doing it. So. Mm -hmm. Wojak was for five dollars. Destiny, you need to go on Tim Pool's IRL and teach him how to completely destroy Vouch like you did on the Kyle Rittenhouse discussion. You wrecked his ass, but Vouch had his lapdog followers were too stupid to realize it. Um, thanks. I missed that one. Uh, you you and Vouch seem to have this love hate relationship. Are you like on a hate tangent now? Um, yeah, I think we're permanently done. Well, for now, I guess I don't know. We'll see. The last time I saw like like y'all together was with that um. Who was it? It was, I think, Stryker and um, Oh, also. Enoch. Or, or no, no, it was Stryker and also. Yeah, you're right. That was one of the most painful debates I think I've ever watched in, in a really long time. Mm -hmm. And this coming from someone who thinks your first debate with Stryker was probably one of the best debates that I've ever watched. Mm -hmm. But that, that one was just, that was painful. It, yeah. it seemed like there was nobody that was making points that actually mattered to what, what was being asked. Mm-hmm. Like anytime they went to also, he just went to some canned answer. Like it was like a politician going to their stump speech mm -hmm. whenever they were asked something that made them uncomfortable. Sure. And and Stryker is just such an idiot that that like arguing with him is tough in the first place just because he's so stupid. Mm -hmm. So it's really tough. But that that one was painful. And, and I, I'm not a fan of Ausch, so and I never have been. Sure. Yeah. I'm like avowedly not socialist. So a lot of people will just their brains kind of turn off right there for a lot of people on the well, left. This might be my big problem. So. And then I'm also. What was also, your argument about Rittenhouse? What did oh, do what? What was your argument on Rittenhouse? Uh, I thought that the Rittenhouse thing, from what I saw, was like just it was one of the clearest and easiest appearances of self defense that I've ever seen in my life. It like it, I I almost regret ever getting into it. Well, obviously because I've suffered so much as a result. But like I don't know. Like I watched the video and I, I couldn't actually believe that there was so much controversy over it. Like people are running up, like trying to attack them. People shooting behind them. Like it was just like pretty obvious to me. But um, obviously the politically charged nature of it like drove a lot of people into insanity. So. I mean, that's what I'm really worried about for the election, to tell you the truth, is it is it is the politically charged nature of it, is mm -hmm. that, you know, both sides are, are, I think a lot of people are on edge right now. And uh, like, I mean, everyone I know, people that are so anti-gun, they, they've they been yelling at me for years that like, they've got to take away all the guns, they, that it's the worst thing you could ever have. They're all going out and buying guns now. Hmm. You know, I have people call me up like, what does a 40 caliber mean? Is that a good one? Like, you know, mm -hmm. so... I don't know. I, I'm I'm really worried about, about what's going to happen after after Tuesday. Yeah, I guess we'll see. I, yeah. I'm hoping for the best, but you know. So what do you, what's your prediction? Uh, and then I'm going to let you go because I know it's late and all that. Um, I think Biden is going to absolutely run away with it. And it looks like he's going to crush it, but we'll see. Do you really? Yes. Is that just because you want him to win, or you think that that he's actually going to win? I think he's actually going to win. It just like the polling is just so dramatically against Trump right now. It's a little unbelievable. But in the last 24 hours, a it seems to have shifted in his favor, and and the the numbers that the polls have put out there mm -hmm. have not been holding up by early voting. Um, a lot of people want to play a lot of games. The numbers, I guess, we'll see on election day. <laughs> There's no, we're true. already we're like days away. I'm sorry, we're two days away. So I, we'll just see. Rather than arguing about the legitimacy or the validity of the polls, blah blah blah. Like a lot of people want to argue about polls because of small things that were on or off. I watched this happen during the Democratic primary. The Democratic primary was incredibly exciting unless you followed the polls and everything went exactly as the polls said it would. It was very exciting to a lot of people that had a lot of conspiracies about how the polls were wrong, they were missing things, Michigan was gonna swing again, like everybody's, but if you actually watch polls, like, oh wait, hold on, Biden's had a massive fucking lead the whole time? Oh, and that was the story of the primary. The guy with the massive lead in the polls the whole time was the guy that won. And I guess we'll see for the election, yeah. Well, I, I really do appreciate you coming on, man. I, I enjoy mm -hmm. these discussions, so. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, man. I, I really do appreciate it. <laughs> Guys, I will see you tomorrow. Um, we got a couple things going on, but I've got like five streams going on on Tuesday for Election Day. Should be a lot of fun. Tune into Destiny's channel. He's always got something great going on. Thank you a lot for showing up, man. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Man. Have a good one. It's called the U.S. flag, you stupid fuck. 
This is the only flag that the United States federally has and recognizes. Why the fuck are you acting like the, a different 